a seriously large conference. You know, I've got two boys at home who actually believe that all of you turned up to hear me. <laughs> um, and, you know, one day, Sophie, they'll become teenagers and they'll, they'll know, know the truth, which is a bit of a shame. Okay, the, um, so what, you know, we, we've heard from some of the great scientists in the world, we've heard from the Dalai Lama about the revolution in our understanding about how our minds work. And clearly, the potential to apply this intellectually, spiritually, emotionally to improve our minds is, is tremendous. But what has all this got to do with the way we work? Can we actually apply it to, to our work in, in practical terms? I want to go from the sort of you know, high philosophical and spiritual heights of this morning to, to much more mundane but, but practical matters. As you can see from, uh, from, uh, from the board, there's a variety of things which I do. And uh, I began life as an academic researcher in, in economics. I became an entrepreneur, started a company called IPAC, which is involved in financial planning. Uh, I thought I was dealing with people's money, but I discovered over thousands of clients that when you deal with people's money, you deal with their lives. Um, we sold the company to a very, very large company in Australia called AXA, uh, Asia Pacific, which is like one of the like, 20 largest companies, I think. And I'm, I'm now also the head of strategy for AXA. And we, we look after about 60% of the, of the world's population. I also have a real passion for, for education, and uh, that's led me to be a, a director of the, of the Smith family. And the reason I go through all that is, you know, what, why, why I love this conference and what we've covered is I believe that practical applications apply to everything I do and everything I'm, I'm interested in. So let me uh, share that with you briefly. I guess I'm so passionate about it, you know, I've spent about five, five or six years with, um, with my co-author, Andrew Ford, who may or may not be here. Uh, researching this, trying to connect the dots into in a book called, called How Much is Enough? But in the, which, which looks at, among other things, at how you apply this research to thinking about money and to thinking about its relationship to day-to-day to -day life. When I think of it, of it in the context of work, the examples I'm going to give you are going to be, the applications are going to be necessarily rel uh, you know, fairly simple. But I'm going to encourage you to try and connect the dots yourself to look at the applications to what you do and to enter and to, and to a bigger picture. Because I think in the, in the 21st century, one of the paradoxes of the century is we live in the most affluent era of human history, but we have record levels of stress, anxiety, and depression. Since the Second World War, we've seen a tripling in wealth in most Western countries, but we've also seen, coincidentally, not causally, but coincidentally, a tripling in the youth suicide rate. In fact, in most Western countries, including this country, for children between the ages of one and 31, the, the highest cause of death uh, is not backyard pools, it's actually, it's actually uh, suicide. And I think a key reason for this is the basic innate skills we're born with are the skills of, of how to survive, not how to thrive, um, or, or to use Martin you know, Sullivan's term, of, of how to flourish. But the beauty of what we've learnt is the skills of how to go from beyond just mere survival mode to, to thriving mode. And I think for, for somebody who's a corporate leader in this era, that you know, for too long, management theorists have focused on money primarily as a, as a motivator of productivity and getting people to work hard. And what this research, I think, tells us is that there's something beyond money. It's not that money is unimportant. But if we can actually inspire people in whatever area of work we're in, to think of a, a noble purpose, to actually think of our business as being that to truly add sustainable value to, 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 to our customers, to not think narrowly just in terms of shareholder returns, that there's the ability to actually motivate people to, 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 to give them a sense of meaning and purpose in their day-to-day -day lives. Because where we spend most of our, 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 our woken time, of course, is at work unless we've retired. And if we can have meaning, purpose, and a sense of intrinsic motivation in our work, it makes a massive difference to our quality of life, indeed, to our ability to, to actually thrive. So what are we going to cover? I want to cover a few things. I just want to talk briefly about how we make decisions. Because how the research we've heard about connects with the world of business is through a theory called behavioral decision-making theory. It looks at what motivates us, to, to actually, and, and our behaviours in, in making day-to-day -day decisions. Once we've explored that briefly, I want to look at three applications. How do we actually deal with choice? Uh, how can we actually use communications 
to improve learning, to improve our ability to actually influence outcomes and Im improve people's lives. And be it in our work, in our day-to-day -day works, how, how can we actually increase the spirit of generosity in our workplaces, or if we work for charities, to actually you know, use some of this knowledge to I increase the generosity of, uh, of our donors? So we've seen so many pictures of the brain, haven't we, in, this, uh, in the last few days? This is my very, very simplistic version of it. I'm going to focus just on two main parts of the brain. For much of human evolution, the main focus of communication and engagement was with the limbic system, the seat of emotions. And I, you know, I take on board what a number of the scientists have said that the brain is really much more integrated than simply sections. But in, in a simplistic sense, much of our engagement was through dance, through, through stories, um, through participation, the, the corroboree, you know, through interaction, not in a screen form, but in a, in a genuine form. And that's how we actually passed on, passed on knowledge and influenced people. Then we saw the evolution of the, the age of reason. You know, René Des, uh, Descartes said, you know, I think, therefore I am. And we saw the, the rise of cognition, the appeal to the neocortex. And the way you appeal to the cortex is really through words, you know, facts, numbers. Quite, it's quite different. And what we've seen over the centuries is that there's been an increasing focus on cognitive presentations, on cognitive reasoning, uh, and less ability to actually engage with the, with the, with the limbic system. Uh, the advertising industry has not made this mistake, but in, in many other professions, including the teaching profession, we, we have. And the key one, I want to say, what, what we now know, because the cortex is the center of conscious thought, it's, it's, it's where we think, the mistake we've made in the modern world is to believe that's where we actually make decisions. In the last 10 years, thanks to MRI scanning technology, we know that in the first instance, a decision tends to be made in the limbic system, and then it tends to be confirmed in the cortex. So the reason you married, um, if you like, uh, you know, Tom or Sally, rather than Harry or Amy, was actually made emotionally, and then confirmed and rationalized after after the event, after you'd made that decision. It doesn't mean the cortex doesn't have an important role in decision making, but it tends to be a post justification rather than the primar primary driver. Okay, so what does this all mean? So let me look at this first example of, of choice. And I'm gonna give you a very simple example. Um, I don't know about you, but I actually love choice. You know, favorite yogurt, favorite cereal, favorite everything else, but does anyone get disabled by choice? It's bloody horrible, isn't it? Like I, I tried to buy a mobile phone the other day. For those of you, th those of you sitting in the front, you'll, you'll realize desperately I need a new mobile phone. Now, I'm quite radical. All I want this phone to do is to be able to make, make phone calls. <laughs> and so I go in there. And the first thing I'm asked is, do you want more pixels? Pixels? What the hell are pixels? And I'm asked, do you want a GPS? No, actually, what I want is a mobile phone. All right. Do you want an iPhone? I was showing an iPhone. Do you know I, an iPhone doesn't even have a keypad? I mean, how do you actually make phone calls with it? <laughs> and now this is before we start talking about mobile phone plans, the 12-month plan, the six-month plan, the 20... I walked out. <laughs> too hard. Too hard. Okay, let's look at something simpler. This is a piece of research which is done by a woman called uh, Sheena Ayanga, professor of psychology at, uh, at Columbia University. And she's done a lot of work on choice. And actually, there's a company called Tesco, which frankly, 20 or 30 years ago, was a third-rate British supermarket chain. But thanks to the application of research like this, among other things, has become probably the world's greatest supermarket chain. And the example's simple. They looked at jams. They, they created a jam display, a very simple thing, in a supermarket and said, what happens when we give people more choice? So first, the display had six jams. And what this shows is that 40%, 40 out of every 100 people coming into that store sampled the jam, yeah, which is not bad. Then they increased the display to 30 jams, massive increase in choice, to, to, to 30 different flavors. Massive increase in choice, and guess what? A lot more people came along and sampled jam. It actually increased by, by from 40% to 60%. What does it tell us? People love choice. People are attracted by choice. But, and here's the but, Tesco is not in the business of giving away free jam. It's in the business of selling jam. What do you think happened to jam sales when they gave more choice? Any, any rough ideas? Up or down? You guys are too smart, All right? 
but the, 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 the decrease was dramatic. That's, you know, the, the, the amount of jam sold went from 30 every 100 customers to three. It was a decrease of 90%. Massive, massive decrease. The underlying research in here, frankly, we'd actually spend half an hour just talking about the slide, but I, I, I don't have the luxury of that time. But some of the key points are this. When the limbic system is faced with choice and it doesn't have the confidence to know how to choose, it basically goes into meltdown mode. It will prefer to make no decision rather than to make the wrong decision. Right now, I've taken a really simple example, but I say this applies to everything. This applies to choice of marriage partners, jobs, school courses, the works. And some of the quick implications of this are that if you're going to be in the business, and I'm talking about business very broadly, of offering choice, navigation aids are critical. So what would, what, what would have helped in that jam example, for example, would have been just aids which said, these jams are bitter, these are, are sickly sweet, these are moderately sweet, right? These are sour. Just, just allowing people to make uh, decisions and choices with a bit more confidence. Increasingly now, what you're seeing in the world of commerce is that choice is being limited. We're seeing supermarkets becoming larger and larger, and they're offering more and more categories of goods, but within each category, the choices are becoming more clearly defined. Typically having a premium brand, you know, a very cheap brand, the discount brand, and then you, 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 what you're finding here, Woolworths, so, so the, the Woolworths brand used to be cheap. Now the Woolworths brand here, following the Tesco example in the UK, says, look, we've checked out all the options for you. Our brand is best value for, 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 for you know, the quality. Um, if you're providing more complex choices, you know, advice is becoming increasingly important. One really interesting thing we found in, in people's pay is with executives, and this is senior executives who have option schemes, at least half the senior executives have no idea how to value their options. And so guess what? They actually devalue <laughs> their pay. So the employer is actually not getting bang for, bang for their buck. So you know, advice is actually quite important. At a personal level, if like me, you get disabled by choice. Now, Professor Barry Schwartz, has some, I think he's speaking at the Happiness Conference in May, he's got some interesting advice. It's far better to be a, what he calls a satisficer than a maximizer. And what he means by a satisficer is somebody who says, just go and get the damn thing which you want, and if it works, that's good enough. Don't worry about trying to get the best deal. Maximizers are the ones who try and get the best deal. They search for everything, they spend hours and hours and hours and hours. And the thing is, even when they get the best deal, they feel less satisfied than a satisficer because they're afraid that somebody else will do better than them. You know the feeling. Okay, um, second application is to look at, um, at communications. And, and, and Paul, Paul Ekman's comments on in, intuition were interesting. I want to comment on, on that in a sec. But I'm, when I'm talking about communications here, I'm not talking about writing reports. I'm talking about communications in a, in a full sense of the word, which is how do we actually influence people's behavior. If we're teachers, how do we actually you know, get across deep and, and important knowledge uh, to our students? And basically, there's two ways of conveying information. Uh, there's cognitive, which appeals to the, to the neocortex. It's somewhat slow in terms of processing. It requires cognitive capacity. Uh, and there's more, more intuitive, which appeals to the limbic system, which is much, much, much faster. Uh, it's holistic. You know, people tend to make decisions much more quickly. Again, I'm going to give you a, a very simple example. I, I need you all to actually participate in this example to, to really make it work. Uh, it's an, it's an exa example of tourism. Um, anyone here been to Bolivia? Anyone been on a travel trip to a few? Fantastic. Stremnaya Road, by any chance? Stremnaya Road is becoming one of the great tourist destinations for adventurers. So I'm going to give you um, about 30, 40 seconds to just read this. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. It probably only require about 15 seconds, but I'll give you about a minute. Okay, we've all more or less, I think, had a chance to read it. Okay, now here's the question. I need some emphatic answers here, please. You have the choice of getting an all-expenses-paid trip 
to ride down the Strem Nile Road. The condition is if, you, if your expenses are paid, you must, you must ride down it. On the information you've got, who says yes? Yes, I'd like to go down this. Gosh, this is a risk-taking group, Tony. This is a <laughs> okay, uh, who says no? Uh, okay, okay, maybe it's not so, okay. And who's not sure? No reason why you're not sure. Okay, let me just present this information to you in a different way. This is the Strimnaya Road. It's beautiful, you can see the uh, cliffs. That's pretty narrow. Uh, yes, that's one. Very narrow. You can see why two vehicles actually fall off this road. And if you fall off, that's what happens. Tell me, is there anyone left who doesn't know what they want to do now? <laughs> okay, and that took, that took us five seconds. It took, took, took me five seconds because it just took me a while to click through it, right? You didn't think, did you? You just looked at those pictures, and the adventurers amongst you said, fantastic, this is even better than I, than I thought. <laughs> right, the nervous ones said, thank God for that. <laughs> I said, no, but none of you, by and large, weren't sure. It, just, it was just like that. And actually, you see Paul Ekman's point that intuitive communication can also be used you know, for both wrong reasons, uh, but also very, very powerfully for, for, for positive reasons. Um, the, to take this to a slightly more serious application, in the world of financial services, in fact, the world generally, one of the big issues around the world is getting people to save enough money. Governments spend hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get people to save money. Now, this is the typical sort of nonsense that my industry produces, you know, sort of massive tables, you can barely read the print, don't worry if you, can, if you can't read the print. But this is an exercise done by the University of California at London Business School. And it was done with, uh, with mature age master's students, trying to encourage them to save. So one half of the group was shown this table. And what this table shows is, for example, if you save 12% of your salary over a working lifetime, you end up with 365,000 pounds, uh, at, at retirement. And the other, the other half of the group was shown the information like this. If you, if you save 12%, then you had a, quite a nice sort of flat in London. <laughs> if you save 4%, you had a mattress. Um, and hopefully you didn't save 0% because that was not very good. The question is, was presenting the information in different ways, did it actually change people's savings behaviour rather than spending hundreds of millions of dollars on education? And guess what? The, the first group, which saw the cognitive information, saved on average, call it 11% of their salaries, which actually is not bad given the, the nonsense in that table. Um, but the second group actually saved 14.5%. That's almost a 50% rise. Now, you know, trust me, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent, and I'm trying to you know, move savings by a fraction of, of a percent. I'm just, just conveying it in, in a different way. Uh, had that effect. So what's, what's the overall point? You might say, okay, a picture's worth a thousand words, but it's more than that. It's actually engaging with the limbic system rather than just with the cognitive system, uh, with the, you know, the, the elements of cognition. And both are valuable. But typically, if you want to change people's behavior, influence, or convey knowledge, the best thing in the first instance is to attract the attention of the limbic system. Use the limbic system to attract, to, to attract attention and then confirm people's idea or sense of it with cognitive information. So it's really both working in, in unison. Okay, the, um, the last application I want to go through is to this notion of, of increasing the spirit of generosity, be it in your workplace, be it as a charity with my, my Smith family hat on. How can we actually do that? And this is an important point because you know, all the psychological research shows that giving, in the broad sense of the word, having a positive impact on others actually significantly improves your well-being. But the problem is we're not actually born knowing that. By and large, it tends to be a, a learned behavior. For those of you who've read Martin Seligman's book, you know, there's a variety of exercises he has with university students, and university students are convinced that buying stuff will lead to more happiness than actually having a positive impact on others until they actually go through various exercises. So how can we actually get people to learn that behavior uh, in the workforce or, or elsewhere? The organization, which frankly is, I think, one of the leaders in this, uh, is a group called Kiva. Um, Kiva was set up, by, uh, set, set up about, only, only about four years ago by, by some very young entrepreneurs, very computer savvy, who, who, who were uh, very successful and wanted to give something back. And they support one of my fav favorite areas, which apart from education, is microfinance. 
So what Kiva does is it links individuals to poor entrepreneurs around the world who are looking to borrow a small amount of money to really try and expand their business. But the power of Kiva is, is really in creating a, a sense of emotional engagement. So you can, you know, you can explore their, their website, and I've done this with, uh, with my two boys. We've sort of negotiated that, that about a third of their Christmas and birthday presents will go in the form of Kiva gift certificates, which can buy, you can buy for as, you know, as, as small amount as, as $25. And you know, initially, the idea is a bit, bit, bit strange. But they, they look at this couple, and this is a couple in, uh, in Cambodia, I think, and they want to borrow some money to buy two cows. And for kids, that's a, a really quirky thing. Actually, for most adults, that's a fairly quirky thing. But then what they discover fairly quickly is those two cows can really transform this family's life. It, it becomes a source, you know, it becomes a daily source of protein-rich uh, rich food. And that's the milk I'm talking about, not the meat. <laughs> Um, it, it provides the, the hard labour to actually increase the productivity of this couple's farm. Over time, with a bit of, with a, a bit of luck, you know, they actually produce calves, and it becomes an investment, and it provides the basis for this couple to actually repay the loan, and then you can actually re-lend it. And the beauty of this whole system is that, really, within a few minutes, you know, people going on this, it cre creates an, an emotional connection with, with the recipient. You see a story, as the, as the loan is actually repaid, you get an update on how they're going, you get a sense of the impact, and the whole thing is actually entirely automated. Kiva in its first year, I think, raised about $5 million. Within four years now, it's raised, it's raised over $100 million. But more than just raising money, it's really been the, the learning you know, for a whole range of people of the power of giving as well. Um, the Smith family, um, which, uh, which I'm involved with, you know, does this well as well. By, by basically, it, it, on its website, it has real people, you know, real stories. So again, there's a sense of actually lending to a, well, in this case, it's actually giving, <laughs> to a real person, a real student. Um, through letters and, and other mechanisms, you actually track the, the progress of your, of your student. Again, emotional engagement, emotional connection, a sense of, of really uplifting you. And again, not, not for, for large amounts of money. But again, by and large, engaging with the limbic system in the first instance, and then providing cognitive information, facts and figures, to, to support the engagement with the limbic system. OK, we have a couple of minutes to go, which is good, because we can now pretty well move to, move to wrap-up mode. We have, in a very, very short period of time, looked at three you know, fairly simple applications of how we go from really quite deep academic research through behavioral decision making into how we can actually apply this. But if I go back to my, my starting comments, I'd encourage you in your various professions, in your various areas of work, in your various areas of passion, to try and connect the dots in this creatively, to have a, a big vision and a big mission for how this can be, this can be used. Because this, this goes beyond simply you know, trying to sell people jams or or, 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 or simply raise money for, you know, be, be it good causes or, or, or other causes. I think fundamentally, the potential we, we have in the 21st century is to achieve something which our ancestors weren't able to do, to flourish, to thrive. And the greatest application of this research is to understand it well and in our daily lives really work out how we can thrive ourselves. Thank you so much.